two, one, two. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. I know I'm the one who's standing between you and lunch, I guess, because now we have lunch. So I'll try to make it quick, but no promises made. So um, today, you saw the panel, or some of you saw the panel. We were talking about databases as a service on Kubernetes, and uh, I will just go deeper into the topic and expand on it. So uh, as an engineer, as a product manager, I like to think about myself as a very calculated person or making decisions based on data, so data-driven person. But what my three beloved kids taught me and teaching me every day is that we're extremely emotional. And uh, our uh, emotions are very complex. So compared to animals, we can fear different scales of emotions. Our emotions are very subjective. But what's important, our emotions are also very contagious. So if you see me smiling, most probably you're going to smile as well. If you see me crying, hopefully you're not going to cry, uh, and so on. And uh, also, what is important about our emotions is that we have this negativity bias, that we tend to focus on our negative emotions more than uh, positive ones. And uh, believe me or not, but you are not in the wrong room. This talk is really about databases on Kubernetes. Uh, but uh, again, like it or not, uh, if you think about yourself as a person who is making decisions based on data, you are not completely wrong. But still, you are going to make a lot of decisions in your life based on uh, emotions. Uh, so is it? Picking your music in your car? Is it picking your technology that your organization is going to use? It's all based on emotions. So in this talk, I want to focus on two things. Um, I will talk about our journey or any engineering uh, journey towards uh, open source RDS or open source database as a service on Kubernetes. What kinds of solutions are there? What kinds of pros and cons are there? And so on. But at the same time, I will also focus on emotional aspect. And uh, we'll try to get you to the point where you are going to be in more comfortable space to run databases on Kubernetes. So database on Kubernetes. I joined Percona four years ago. And the world was different. I was different. As I said before, I had hair. So you most probably saw the picture. And um, I had strong belief that Databases on Kubernetes, no, no. <laughs> it's for stateless. It's for stateless applications. Data sits somewhere. My application is immutable. No way. Right? And even today, four years later, databases on Kubernetes still spark different emotions. And uh, what we learned in Percona in this four years or even more is that um, there are three main reasons why somebody would run uh, data on Kubernetes. The first one is usually strategy, is that uh, you already have a lot of expertise in running everything in there in Kubernetes. Uh, your all applications, stateless applications are there. And now you're in a happy place. OK, I need to uh, be brave. I will run databases there as well. And you start moving it there. Uh, and it's important to note that um, the strategic decisions of choosing Kubernetes as a whole, forget about the data for a second, is more about cloud neutrality and no vendor lock-in, because Kubernetes enables you to run your applications anywhere. You don't need to be running in Amazon only. You can run on-prem, you can run on Google Cloud, or DigitalOcean, or whatever environment you uh, love. Cost. Cost is another reason. It might be the reason why people choose cloud native at first. Like, we want to reduce her cost. We heard it's a good idea. But for databases specifically, if you do it right, it's not only about your infrastructure, but it is also about reducing the cost on uh, uh, manual tasks. So you can automate a lot of things. You can uh, uh, focus on what really matters for your business versus doing some really uninteresting things there. And the, the, that brings us to automation, that as you can automate a lot of things 
on uh, Kubernetes, well, why just not do it for databases uh, as well? And automation comes from various forms uh, in cloud native ecosystem. It's about uh, automating your high availability. It's about uh, doing blue-green deployments and failovers and many more. Going back to emotions. So there are common fears of running databases in uh, Kubernetes. Uh, the first one that I hear a lot is performance. So it, it sounds like my databases are going to be slow on, in containers or in Kubernetes. That was the same fear 10, 15 years ago when people were thinking of moving databases from bare metal servers to VMs. Now today, is, everything is a VM. Uh, and, uh, Nobody is scared. The same goes with Kubernetes. And I, I will not go too deep into this topic, but I can say that we've done multiple benchmarks. We published them. And uh, your performance on Kubernetes is going to be as good as your hardware. It's going to be within 1%, 2% uh, uh, difference of variation. The next fear is maturity. Is Kubernetes mature enough to run my databases? I'm scared. Right. Well, I, I was scared as well four years ago, um, and this is a fair question, and we'll look into various possible options on the next slides. Uh, and complexity. Let's be honest, Kubernetes itself is a complex beast. Uh, it has some learning curve, and uh, adding databases on top of it, well, it doesn't sound like a, a good uh, idea at first, but again, we'll look deeper into that on the following slides and hope I'm gonna change your mind and will conquer and battle these fears. So let's start with uh, baby steps. Chapter one, enthusiasm and Kubernetes 101. And that's not my imagination on the next slides, it's how things were around four years ago and how sometimes engineers do databases on Kubernetes even today. Uh, so all these images are AI generated, so don't mind the number of fingers and other things. Uh, <laughs> it's the usual thing. But OK, let's start. You are, your inner child is happy. You deployed your first database uh, in a pod in Kubernetes. It just runs, and you're all excited about it, and you're studying your journey. Now, as it is a database, it's stateful. So what you need to do, you need to have storage. For storage in Kubernetes, what do you have? You have PVC, persistent volume claim. And I deliberately don't mention um, storage class, persistent volumes, all other various variations. We don't want to be scared with that. We're in a happy place. So let's not rush there. It all works. We have pod, we have storage. Awesome. Uh, storage is there. Now what I want, I want to connect to my database. That's the point, right? So I deployed it, how do I use it? So for that, I add a service. And again, I'm not overcomplicating it. I'm not saying that there are load balancers, node ports, cluster IPs, ingresses. I don't want to scare anybody. I'm still happy. We run it, I can connect to my database, looks like it's working. Okay, now what do I need? I need to add some password because I don't want anyone to connect to my database. I need it to be secure. I also need some configuration, some fine tuning. So I add secrets and I add config maps, a well-known construct in Kubernetes world. And again, it can be more complex because MySQL itself has thousands of parameters that you can fine tune, but let's not go too deep into the woods. We're still happy. And now, we also heard that there is a thing called stateful sets. Well, I heard it's a good thing. It's called stateful sets. So I'm going to use it for my database. I'm just going to wrap everything uh, around and use it. So now my secrets and config map are pointing to stateful sets, services as well. I'm happy, still working. Let's go. OK, we're getting into a bit more deeper conversation now. We need HA, high availability. How do I do high availability? OK, I'm just going to add one more pod into my stateful set. I'm going to add a bit more configuration into it so that I configure replication. There is an example in gray for Postgres, I think. 
uh, how to configure the replication. So I do that, and uh, the database runs properly, so I have replication, that's fine, but I'm already feeling the burden a bit of complexity and maybe even lack of maturity. I don't need to do all these things in RDS. I mean, it just works for me, but here it's a bit complex. But there is more, actually. So, okay, I configured HA, it's awesome, but what if there is a failover, something fails, how does it work? So what I do, I add some secret HA source into my database pods. For Postgres, it can be Petroni, for MySQL, it can be Orchestrator. That would make a decision if I need to fail over and fail back and how to do that. But also, I need some proxy in front of it. Again, for Postgres, it can be PG Bouncer, PG Pool, for Mongo, it, Mongo S, whatever it is. But it's just getting more and more complex. So the question is, where is my simplicity? Because you promised me, Sergey, that it's gonna be simple. Well, not so much, right? But let's revive our inner child a bit. Here's a candy, infrastructure as a code. Boom, everything is solved. With it, you can do wonders. You put your YAML manifest behind, you take Terraform, you take Helm charts, you take whatever tool you are used to, and now you can do wonders. You can click a button and everything is just working. You don't care about YAML manifest. It's not that complex anymore for you. Awesome, you conquered their complexity. But what is even better, you can replicate, you can repeat it. So you now can go to your engineer, you can go to your friend and tell him, hey, I created this nice thing, just use it, click a button and you're gonna have um, databases up and running, right? So our inner child is a bit in a happier place today. But that goes, that, that leads us to second chapter, disillusionment and operators 101. So here we're gonna talk about how infra as a code is an illusion, that it's not really adding a lot of simplicity for us for databases, and we'll talk about operators. So, <laughs> gladly at Percona we have a lot of uh, smart folks, and four years ago we understood that deployment is the simplest task. You can easily deploy anything on Kubernetes quite fast, and that's what I see a lot of marketplaces are doing, that they tell you, oh, you can deploy anything, just click a button and it's up and running for you. But what we always forget is uh, day two operations, especially for databases, is the biggest point. Uh, deployment is easy, management is hard. Now you need to think, how do I scale my database? How do I fine tune it? How do I monitor it, backup, restore, upgrade? And the list goes on, right? So, uh, hello operators. That is where operators are simplifying everything for you. And uh, back then we understood that uh, it's the best opportunity for us to codify our expertise that we have in uh, Procona around databases and share it with the users so that the users can just use the databases, fine tune them without the need to think, okay, uh, what is it inside? And that's what operators do. So on the left you have uh, Kubernetes primitives, on the right you have database configuration, and operators operate exactly in the middle. So what they do is, again, it's 101 course, it's you submit, you declare what you want to have, you list the version of the database, the number of replicas that you need to have, where to store backups, how to uh, tune it, and so on. And you just ship this YAML manifest to Kubernetes API, and operator pod uh, does the rest. It deploys all the Kubernetes primitives that are extremely complex sometimes to learn, and it also configures your database piece, your replication, HA, and everything around it. But the beauty of operators is not only that they can deploy, but also that they can manage. So you can talk to operator and tell it, hey, I need to scale it up, or I need to upgrade, or I need to um, back it up and restore, or whatever. 
and operators are going to do it for you with the best practices that are encoded uh, within. And phones up, take a picture, another one for smiles. So that's how I usually look at people who are deploying their first database on Kubernetes uh, without operators, and then when they finally discovered, oh, there is a nice thing called um, uh, operators, right? But um, so we have operators. They um, automate everything, which is awesome. Uh, I'm in my happy place. My inner child is happier. Do I have database as a service? Well, I'm not really so sure, right? And the reason for that is operators are building blocks. So, uh, and I, I have Lego blocks here, and believe me or not, but it was extremely hard for me to put all the logos in those, so I had very limited space, so excuse me that if I forgot somebody. Uh, but yeah, there, there are a bunch of operators, there are a bunch of components in the uh, Kubernetes ecosystem, and with these components, you can build something. But it's still quite a manual exercise where you need to configure it yourself, you need to understand how, this, how all of these components work together. One of the examples is uh, Cert Manager, usually, because you need to manage your certificates. Yes, you can configure it, but do you want to put a lot of logic into operator to do all the heavy lifting of it? No, you're gonna most probably configure set manager here and then just tell the operator, oh, you know, I have certificate here. And the same goes for vertical pod autoscaler uh, and other things. Also, DBAS is usually is UI and API, so you want to give your developer some interface that he or she can click and uh, use the database or deploy and manage it. And uh, also, for me, the biggest problem is multi-cluster story, because we hear more and more use cases where somebody wants to run databases across different clouds, across different regions, and definitely uh, doing it with operators is possible today. Various operators can do that, but it's still a manual effort that you need to configure it one place and another place, connect the dots. It's gonna work, but it's not really fully automated. So, chapter three, uh, hope and DBAS. So, in this chapter, we are going to hopefully get back on track and revive our in child. So, what we did in uh, Percona, we created an open source uh, DBAS, or somebody on Reddit called it open source uh, RDS. It's called Percona Everest. It has uh, a nice and uh, sleek UI that you can use. It has API. You click a button and it deploys databases on Kubernetes uh, for you, no hassle, and it's fully open source again. A bit of an architecture of it, so on a high level it looks like that, and I will um, go through each and every component right now. So for front end, we have React plus Material UI. For back end, it's just pure uh, Golang, nothing super exciting and fancy. All the uh, common components. Uh, when user wants to interact with Everest, they either interact through the web UI, which is going to front end, obviously, or through API that is interacting with uh, the back end written in Golang. But also we have Everest operator, and I'll talk more about it, but it's also something that we found quite interesting that user interact with it directly. But I'll talk more about it in a second. Uh, we also use OLM, uh, Operator Lifecycle Manager. The reason is that we have, right now, I think, four operators within, and definitely managing the versions, ensuring that uh, we do not forget some fields, that the, there is inter interoperability in place, and that things is definitely a must for us, so OLM is a great tool to manage operators, and later on we plan to add um, more operators into the picture. And uh, more about Everest operator. What it is, is a unified uh, custom resource definition. What it basically does, it um, uh, translates the custom resources to the operators. 
So you define some manifest for Everest operator saying, hey, I want Postgres, I want this number of nodes, I want replication, yada, 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 and it translates it to the uh, Percona operator, for example, the manifest, or it can translate it to any other operator. So it's just a centralized uh, operator to rule them all. And we, we found it quite interesting that some of our users, they don't need the UI, they don't need the API, but they love the idea that there is one big operator that they can interact with instead of learning how to work with other uh, different operators. And w what I'm going to do next, I'm going to talk more about the problems and solutions that we were looking at when we were working on uh, Procona Everest. So problem number one, uh, or I, I can say it was a mistake, number one, is that it is just the UI. And I, I, I would be frank, I had this idea that, hey, guys, we have operators. They can do all the wonders. What we need to have is just a fancy UI on top of it. Just stick it on top of the operators and you are done, we have DBAS. And that was the mistake. The reason for that is first, obviously you also need API. You can't tell your developers, hey, just go use Kubernetes API instead. I have a nice UI, sorry guy or, or girl, forget about that. And the, uh, the next one was the idea that there are too many custom resources. Again, we want our database as a service solution to take all these building blocks and build something beautiful for us. And again, thinking that it's just the UI would make, would make it completely unmanageable for the developers or for anyone uh, to use later on, because you will need to make sure that your UI can talk to all these various custom resources or Kubernetes primitives, and it's extremely complex uh, story. And that, the, the solution for that was, as I shown on their architecture before, is proper application, so we now have front end, back end, and we have a super operator to rule everything in uh, Kubernetes to rule the old operators. That is another example of a non-existent problem that we created for ourselves. Uh, it's when we started doing that, we said, okay, we need to run our database as a service in Docker, outside of Kubernetes. I, I don't know why we thought that it would be a good idea. But we said, okay, it's gonna be running outside of Docker, and we're gonna register Kubernetes clusters into it, and it immediately created a lot of problems for us. Like, hey, you need to keep state somewhere, that's why we added a database uh, into this Docker image or somewhere nearby. Then you need to back up this database, you need to manage it. So it's kind of weird that you're creating DBAS, but you also have a database running somewhere else. Um, then um, managing all the Kubernetes clusters, how do you register a Kubernetes cluster? Are you giving the config or a service account, or you are telling the Kubernetes cluster to connect to this Docker image? So it was just a pain, and what we made the decision, you saw it again, we decided, okay, we're gonna go full uh, cloud native, everything is going to run on Kubernetes from day zero. And it's again, it's more like a product management problem, I think, where we thought, oh, that's the problem that we need to solve, let's do that. Uh, another one is reinventing authentication, and the, 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 the screenshot on the left is the real one from our internal documentation, how we thought about it, and the goal was, okay, we need to provide proper user authentication, role-based access control, integrations with LDAP, with everything, and uh, we decided we are going to have this tool called Citadel. It's an open source tool to uh, do all this magic, and when we started onboarding it, it again created so many issues. It's just we are trying to build a cathedral instead of building a small MVP or a small product, and we need to manage all these Citadel things and so on. And the solution for that was uh, we decided, no, we're going to follow again the cloud native way. We're just going to make sure that everything is integrating nicely uh, with uh, other things. And we have OEDC, 
now in uh, Everest, so you can integrate with uh, LDAP and with other uh, authentication solutions. The only thing that we had to implement within uh, Everest is role-based access control, but that was not much of a heavy lift. Um, pluggability, more value. That's where I see the biggest value coming in, is right now uh, what we support in Everest is MySQL, Postgres, and Mongo, and all through our operators. But at the same time, we also acknowledge the need that, okay, we need to support more databases. And not only that, we can support, for example, Cloud Native PG uh, along with our Postgres operator, because there might be uh, people who would say, oh, looks like Cloud Native PG, I like it more. I'm going to run it in Everest instead of Procon operator. And we're fine because it's fully open source product, but the idea is that, yeah, we need to simplify the pluggability story a lot because right now it's kind of heavy lift. First, you need to um, change the Everest operator a bit so that it can talk to the database operator that you want to introduce, and then you also need to alter a bit the front end, so React and uh, MUI piece. And it's a heavy lift, I acknowledge that. It's not that easy, so we are working on simplifying this story so that it would be extremely easy for anyone to add databases into Everest. So I really, really like what we have today and the potential of the product to change the future of databases in uh, Kubernetes. It is open source, it is pluggable, it runs anywhere, anywhere because of Kubernetes. It supports multiple databases. It's multi-regional because you can connect different Kubernetes clusters. The future is really, really, really bright, and I'm happy about it. That takes us to Epilogue. So we saw that running databases on Kubernetes can be really, really scary. You can overcomplicate it. You can uh, go with the manual path, and that would take you to the places that you don't like to go. You can simplify it instantaneously and get your inner child to a much happier place with operators that, where you can just deploy databases and manage them, which is more importantly. And the next piece is your inner child wants a bit more excitement. You want to simplify it even more and open source the best you want, as Yoda would say. So it's your choice whether you want to go on the dark side and uh, run everything manually, even with infrastructure code without day two operations, or you want to have building blocks like operators, or you want to have Procona Everest to provide even better user experience. But just like, oh, sorry. on can uh, lift your mood, the right technology can uh, empower and inspire. It can connect you to the world, to the open source world, most hopefully. But also, just as unpleasant song can uh, disrupt your flow, their own tech can drain energy and distract you from what matters most, developing your applications, not managing databases. And as a closing statement, I just want to say that Choose your emotions carefully. Stay on the bright side. Thank you.